These are the oldest stories, online at oldeststories.net. We are finally beginning Season 2 of the podcast, where we enter into the Iron Age. I didn't honestly expect that I would ever actually get here. My original plan was to stop at the Bronze Age collapse, but as I learned more, I realized both that the missing the Iron Age would be missing out on all the most exciting stories, and also that the so-called Bronze Age collapse is not really that great of a sea change as far as Mesopotamia is concerned. Now, sure, Anatolia and the Levant are completely overrun by barbarians, and Egypt's 19th dynasty is about to collapse, but Babylon and Assyria are busy doing kind of their own thing. Sure, they've both been struggling from the collapse of international trade and the rise of various enemy groups, but they still have more or less control of their centers, and they're still quite busy trying to wipe each other off the face of the earth. Perhaps more importantly, a lot of the stuff that was set up in the Bronze Age is going to have its payoff as we truly enter into the Age of Empires. That said, the period from about 1200 to 1000 BCE is a difficult time, no question about it. Our sources drop off substantially, as does pretty much every marker of prosperity that we can see. Perhaps most telling, remember how Bronze Age rulers of Mesopotamia were always bragging about their great construction projects, new canals and walls and temples and so forth? Well. Once we get into the Babylonian Isin dynasty, which covers most of the hardest parts of this period, we're going to see basically none of that in the record. Still, even in these dark times, the indefatigable human spirit is able to continue making things even harder for each other. And there are plenty of war stories to go around for the entire period, most of them completely senseless struggles between North and South. Well, I do say senseless, but as we'll see, there are certain motivations for it. Anyway, since we really haven't heard anything at all about Mesopotamian political history in very close to a year of real podcast time, and since I'm trying to emphasize that there was a great deal of continuity between the Bronze and Iron Ages in Mesopotamia, we're going to have to step back a little bit for some review. And speaking of how long it has been, my life has kind of sort of settled down enough that I'm reasonably confident I can keep the podcast going all the way to the Persian conquest that ends independent Mesopotamian history, but we're going to have to keep this fortnightly release schedule to do it. Now, I personally would like to release more often, but I am working in a completely new industry, living on a new continent, and I have an actual family now. Plus, Let's be honest, the modern world is far more full of distractions than the Iron Age ever was, and so this is probably the best I can manage. Also, one more quick podcast note, there are apparently a lot of ways that you can leave comments or notes on the show, and not all of them I actually have any way to respond to. Uh, sometimes I get like voice messages from people, and it's like, I don't have any idea how to contact this person. So if you have any questions or you want to actually contact me and get a response, check out the contact page on oldeststories.net. Now any other way of contacting me, I, I do check a lot of these things every couple weeks. You may get an answer, you may get missed completely, you may hear back from me uh, five months later, who knows. Anyway, for Babylon, we need to go back in time to the Kassite period. You'll recall that the Kassites were the guys that brought horses into Mesopotamia, migrating in from somewhere eastward, and ended up taking command over Babylonia after the Hittite sack fully ended the Amorite dynasty of Hammurabi back in 1595. Throughout the Bronze Age, the Kassites governed conservatively and generally pretty well, but they were always a foreign element among a mostly Akkadian population. 
The Kassite period saw Babylon really cement itself as a cultural center, not just for Mesopotamia, but for the wider Near East, and it was in large part due to Kassite patronage of Akkadian culture that this was possible. And religiously, we discussed the growth of the cult of Marduk, Babylon's patron god, in this period. But despite all of this, the Kassite rulers always kept one foot in the city and one foot in the tent, maintaining separate religious rituals for the traditional Kassite deities, keeping separate Kassite settlements within the major cities, and eventually constructing Dur Kurigalzu as the new capital center a bit north of Babylon. Meanwhile, up in the north, the city of Asher was coming out of a centuries-long low point. A fellow named Asher Ubalat I broke free of Mitanni power around 1350 BCE, and his and his successors rapidly ate the corpse of the Northern Empire until they not only supplanted it, but in certain ways exceeded it. The 13th century was a fantastic century to be a Syrian, with Adad Nirari, Shalmaneser, Tikulti Ninurta, all being long-lived, aggressive, and victorious kings, one right after the other. This culminated in the conquest and occupation of Babylon in 1225, though that occupation ended up being the Akkadian version of Vietnam, and Babylonian resistance was able to retake the city. However, in the next few decades, things in Babylon get a bit confusing, and it seems likely that not only were there various people outside the Kassite dynasty potentially claiming kingship, but there were also Elamites and Assyrians attacking as well. The Kassite dynasty won't formally end until 1158, at least by the standard reckoning, and I guess since it is season two, I should remind you, all of these dates are fuzzy. They're going to get better as we go along, but if you see somebody else with slightly different dates, even off by a couple decades, that's that's really fine. That's people where the historians are doing the best that we can do. Uh, at least it's we're only going to be off by a couple decades and not a couple centuries like we were at the start of the early Bronze Age. Anyway, uh, the Kassite dynasty doesn't end until 1158 when the last Kassite king was killed during the Elamite sack of Babylon. Now that same sack will see the precious statue of Marduk stolen away to Elam, a massive blow to the religious life of a city that has slowly come to venerate their patron god far more than many other places did. Now, the Assyrians, following to Kulti Ninurta's Babylonian quagmire, fell into a series of succession crises, which is probably the main reason that the last Kassites were able to limp along for as long as they did. But finally, in 1179, or maybe 1169, the palace drama ended with one of the least dramatic kings of the period, a fella named Asher Dan, which, if I'm being honest, is one of my favorite names in all of Mesopotamian history. There are, and there are some pretty cool ones. And I, I have asked my wife if we can name our next child Asher Dan. And like all of my other Mesopotamia-themed naming suggestions, I was given no encouragement to continue suggesting these sorts of names. Anyway, if anyone wants to name their rock and roll band Asher Dan and the Issen Dynasty, you have my blessing. Anyway, for all that he has a cool name, and I should be clear, he's not part of the Issen Dynasty. He's the Assyrian king, the Issan dynasty is the Babylonian king. Anyway, Asherdan is a long-lived nobody in history, which honestly was probably the best that Assyria could hope for at that time. He ruled for probably 30 or 40 years, long enough to bring some much-needed stability to the government, and he did the three things a king needed to do. He conquered a bit of territory, stabilized his vassals, and built stuff. Specifically, we hear from a later chronicle that at some point in his very long reign, he was able to claim three minor cities from the Babylonian border, just the sort of victory that established legitimacy in the eyes of the domestic nobility. 
Following that, we have a single note from a single archive describing a list of greeting gifts which one of his sons received from various governors around the empire. But just this list of governors is revealing of the Assyrian situation. On one hand, we know that folks from the Kaaba region, what's today eastern Syria, all the way to the Arapa region at the foothills of the Zagros Mountains, basically the western Iranian border, were still committed enough to the empire to be sending stuff in tribute. At the same time, from the titles, we get the strong impression that at least some of those sending their gifts were less governors and more like semi-autonomous princelings. And it's far from clear how committed they actually were to being part of the greater Assyrian polity. The centralization which Ashurdan's forefathers had worked so hard to establish has mostly slipped away, though it may well still hold fast in the home regions on the upper Tigris around Asher and Nineveh. As to what he built, we have no idea. All we have is a single fragment from a single later archive which calls him Asherdan the Builder. The nearby fragments make mention of a courtyard and a temple, something in a street, and a decoration on a gate, but the whole thing's so broken it isn't even clear if these are things that Asherdan built or if they were built by a king before him or if they weren't even actually construction projects at all, but the site of like some event going on in this in this place. Still, even though he's super obscure, the mere fact that he appears to have governed more or less responsibly for a few decades may have been enough to break the cycle of civil conflict and assassination. I mean, not right away, his two sons killed each other fighting for the throne, but after them, we get to Asher Resh Ishi, and then we need to look back at what's been going on in Babylon to understand the dynamics of the 1120s better. At the end of the Kassite period, we see signs that the decline in Babylon was making the ruling dynasty notably less popular, and we see various efforts to appease the Akkadian locals, such as the first Kassite kings who start taking Akkadian names. At the same time, we see that this isn't working. And when Babylon was sacked, there were various candidates for kings competing for power. Much of this simmers underneath the surface, at least from a historical point of view. Nearly all of our written records come from official sources in the temple and governments, and so there's very little incentive to write about rebellions unless they were solidly crushed or completely victorious. Somewhere in all that, the northern Sumerian city of Isin, which you may remember from the Isin dynasty, was becoming a bit more prosperous than the other southern cities. Something to consider, though nothing we can really prove, is that the Euphrates River shifted course often, and had many small branches running throughout the region of Sumer. It is possible that the waterway shifted more towards Isin in this period just by natural chance. In subsequent centuries, we see from the other major southern city, Nippur, that they're losing population and Isin is gaining. And so perhaps the river shifted away from the ancient religious center and towards Isin. But again, this is pure speculation. Anyway, Within the city of Isin, there seems to have been a political faction of native Akkadians gaining some amount of power. We know basically nothing about them. We don't, we don't know when they actually emerge. Some think that these folks, led by a fellow named Marduk Kabit Ahesu, emerged in the final year of the Kassite period, establishing a parallel kingship in the regions where the Kassites held little authority. In this view, when the Elamites invaded in 1158, wiping out the Kassite dynasty, Marduk Kabit Aheshu, already playing king down in Sumer, did what he could to ward off the invaders, and when they left, he was able to establish himself in the ruins of Babylon, founding the Isin dynasty, or what historians call the Second Isin dynasty, to distinguish them from the Isin Larsa period of the Middle Bronze Age. <laughs> 
Another theory posits that there were no coherent internal oppositions to the Kassite dynasty on the eve of the Elamite invasion. And when the Easterners withdrew from the city after three years, there were a few more years where no one could credibly lay claim to the throne of Babylon. Now this time would undoubtedly have been a chaotic one, and it is from the madness that Marduk Kabit Aheshu's faction emerged victorious. With the tiny amount of data available to us, either that early or late scenario are at least plausible, and there's really enough open space for someone to write a pretty exciting novel about Marduk Kabit Aheshu's rise to power, liberally deploying the power of imagination to make up for any factual deficiencies. Now, whatever the scenario, the Issan dynasty is going to rule over Babylon for the next 200 years. Interesting note on that, though we call them the Issan dynasty, because that's what later chronicles called it, curiously though, we don't have a single instance of any of the Issan dynasty kings presenting themselves as the king of the city of Issan. There are some who think that the whole Issan thing may have actually been a mistranslation, or perhaps a bit of wordplay, and that actually a similar word was meant. The main heart of the argument was that, up until now, every single Mesopotamian kingdom was centered around the city where the ruling dynasty ruled. The Akkadian Empire was based around Akkad. The Ur dynasty was founded in Uruk, but then it moved to Ur after the first generation. The Issan and Larsa periods saw kings of both Issan and Larsa, and since then the kings of Babylon have been based out of Babylon. And of course, up north, the Assyrian kings are all based in Asher. Now, following this model, Marduk Kabat Aheshu, if he was actually from Issan, should have been remembered as the founder of an Issan kingdom, not a Babylonian Issan dynasty. Now, this is not a crazy thing to think, and these scholars may be well correct, but I actually think that the Issan dynasty was from Issan, and they maintained a power base there the entire time. Now, granted, I base this off of only two data points, one being that the name is read as Issan by most history books out there. The second point is that the city of Issan itself will grow in importance in this period, possibly becoming the largest city in Sumer at this point. Not larger than Babylon. Babylon isn't in Sumer. It's north of Sumer in, well, now, we, now they call it Babylonia, but it previously would have been considered part of Akkad. And being the largest city in Sumer at this point, after centuries of desertification and barbarian attacks and plundering, it doesn't say very much. Anyway, it's not the point. The point is, if it's truly an Issan dynasty, maintaining a power base in Issan, but ruling from Babylon and claiming to be a Babylonian, not Issan-based kingdom, this is a hugely significant shift in how people are thinking about empires. For the Issan dynasty, it's no longer super significant to be the leader of a single city, unless that city is Babylon. Because with Babylon just inherently comes a lot of extra stuff. In the old days, kings of great empires were the rulers of large numbers of cities and held the title King of Sumer and Akkad because, at least in theory, even, even to those kings, all these cities and regions were separable. You could have been the King of Sumer and not Akkad and vice versa. Now, however, ideological and probably administrative centralization has taken over such a hold on the minds of the people that even folks from Issen could take power in the empire and generally be considered a native dynasty. The fact that they were from a different city isn't super important anymore. The fact that they spoke Akkadian and followed the gods of Sumer and Akkad, particularly loved Marduk and his son Nabu, well, that made them part of Greater Babylonia. Now, why is this such a big deal? Because we started our story way back in the early Bronze Age in a world of city-states, 
Sargon of Akkad had to really teach people the idea of empire. He teach them, taught them mostly with, you know, pointed sticks, and it didn't stick super well. The territorial kingdoms of the late Bronze Age has shifted people's ideas of what a nation was. And it's here that we've reached a point where empire is undoubtedly a valid concept in the minds of most people. Now, this is hugely important because we're on the cusp of the Age of Empires. I do throw the word empire around quite freely in previous episodes, and some people are bothered by that. I think most people understand intuitively what I mean when I say empire. It can mean a lot of different things, but now it's meaning something more imperial, if that makes any sense. I don't know. It'll take a few hundred years for anyone to really get their act together. But once we kick it off fully with the Neo-Assyrian Empire, the history of this whole region is going to be one empire after another. Assyrian, followed by Babylonian, followed by Persian, followed by Greek, followed by Roman, and Persian again, until finally the Islamic period changes everything into something else. Cities are still important, and they still have local identities. But we can much more confidently talk about large-scale territorial states and empires in a way that did not apply as much before. Now, this is a very slow process of transition. It isn't like the Isin dynasty invents it. Rather, the Isin dynasty is very close to the conclusion of a centuries-long shift. Anyway... The Isin dynasty isn't going to do a whole lot with this new ideology. They're mostly focused on boosting worship of Marduk and continuing in the same vein as the Kassites. Indeed, looking at local records, we often find that while the Kassite kings may be gone, the local administrators still bear Kassite names and are probably ethnic Kassites in a lot of cases. This is most common in the east, along the Tigris, where Kassites were more populous and dominant anyway. But the Kassite population seems to be largely uninterested in raising up a second Kassite dynasty, at least not on ethnic grounds. With one exception we'll get to in the future. Institutions, in general, were largely preserved from the former period, and there's even a record of an uncertain land holding that was resolved by appealing to a decree by King Golkashar of the Sealand dynasty 700 years and three dynasties previously. Culture was also preserved. And while little survives from this period relative to other periods, it was unquestionable that what was established in the Kassite period was built upon in the Isin period. It's in these 200 years that many foundations of mathematics, astronomy, astrology, divination, and medicine were laid, which will later develop into the advanced science that will astound Greek visitors to Babylon in centuries to come. Marduk Kabit Aheshu, whose name means Marduk is the most important among his brothers, was involved in all of these cultural and political transitions. But what he actually did is mostly obscure. He ruled somewhere between 15 and 20 years alongside Ashurdan of Assyria. But for actual concrete accomplishments, we hear only that he conquered the city of Ekalatum, possibly from the Elamites or Maybe from the Assyrians, we're not completely sure. If it was from the Assyrians, note that Ashurdan is around that time claiming to have conquered three border towns from Babylon. Perhaps they traded cities, one king pushed west while the other pushed east. Perhaps the cities were not conquered but merely plundered. Perhaps Ecolatum was held by the Elamites, whose movements are very obscure in this period, but were clearly in a moment of relative strength in which case Assyria took from Babylon, while Babylon took from Elam. Whatever the case, Marduk Kabit Aheshu died around 1140 or 1135 and was replaced by his son, Idimarduk Balatu, whose name means, in Marduk there is life. 
Idimar Duke Balatu has the unfortunate distinction of being such an obscure king that most references to his name are actually discussing a scribe who wrote some notable tablets in the 6th century BCE. He's so obscure that we're going to see his name pop up a bunch of times and we have no idea if it's talking about the king or just some random schmuck that had the same name. He does call himself King of Kings and Favorite of the Gods, a pair of titles that have not been appropriate for Babylonian rulers for quite some time. But while boastful and sometimes fanciful epithets are often claimed by ancient rulers, to go for King of Kings without any notable lineage or notable successes to back it up would paint a pretty poor picture of Idi Marduk Balatu's character. We think he continued the war with Assyria in fits and starts, though without much effect, and the Elamites appear to have raided all the way to the east bank of the Tigris without Idi Marduk Balatu being able to do much to stop them. Then, after eight years, he died. He was succeeded by Ninurta Nadin Shumi, whose name means Ninurta is the giver of offspring. Much is made of the fact that we can't definitively tie him to the previous kings, and we don't know for sure that he was actually in the same line as Idi Marduk Balatu. But at the same time, later writers still considered him part of the Isin dynasty, and the importance of the city of Isin seems to remain unchanged, so we have no real reason to think that he isn't related, since we have so little go on either way. In terms of material remains, all we have to confirm that this guy was ever even king, aside from some mentions in later kings lists, is a pair of bronze daggers, inscribed with the words, Belonging to Ninurta Nadin Shumi, King of the World, King of Babylon, King of Sumer, and Akkad. Now granted, this doesn't tell us much, but it does indicate that whatever was going on with his predecessor, the tendency to take overly grand titles uh, seems to have at least paused a little bit. Though King of the World is a bit of a grand thing to claim in and of itself, and indeed something his Assyrian counterpart is claiming at the exact same time, this was a pretty typical title, along with the claims to Babylon, Sumer, and Akkad, indicate that Ninurta Nadin Shumi had a more typical view of his own kingship. That said, history only really remembered Ninurta Nadin Shumi for the fact that he was the father of the next king of Babylon, who would turn out to be a pretty solid guy. At least that's what Babylonian histories were called. Archaeologists mostly remember him because of a few fragments that outline his involvement with the ceaseless war between Babylon and Asher. But that so story is told entirely through northern sources. So we're going to set down Ninurta Nadin Shumi in Babylon and pick back up at the tail end of Asher Dan's reign, a few years before Ninurta Nadin Shumi took the throne. We remember that Asher Dan ruled a very long time, until around 1134, with rather little show for it in the archaeological or written record. We also know that he had two sons, or at least two sons that matter, and that by the time Asher Dan was getting old, his two sons both had high positions in government. Almost certainly, one of them was being groomed to take over as king, while the other was being groomed to be a good and supportive younger brother. Which is which, however, is unclear, and either as soon as Asher Dan died in 1134, or possibly a bit before, one of the two attacked the other, and a power struggle ensued. The specifics of what they were fighting over have been lost, but ultimately each desired the throne, and was willing to kill his own brother to get it. As best I can tell, one brother had a power base among the vassals in the outskirts of the kingdom, while the other had a power base within Asher itself and it's this centrally located brother who won. Most chronologies put them one after the other, but I do think it's a bit likely that each was proclaimed in the same year in different parts of the kingdom. Now, the two brothers clashed at a town called Sishil, though the outcome is not preserved. 
but it seems like the brother who controlled the center of the kingdom prevailed, while the other fled to Babylon in exile. The exiled king would possibly play a role in later politics as a puppet that the Babylonians waved around to give some tiny amount of legitimacy to their ongoing war in the north, but ultimately, neither of these two figures, whose names I haven't bothered to burden you with, really mattered at much at all in wider history. The brother who won died in the same year that he won, and his son, Asher Resh Ishi I, would take the throne. And here's where the stories really start to get interesting. You see, up until now, we've mostly been working with fragments. Filling out the life of all but the most significant kings has been essentially impossible due to how scanty the written record is. Now, don't get me wrong, I've been able to fill up 120 episodes until now, and we've left a pretty good amount of stuff out. But let me illustrate what I mean. There's a series of academic books collecting royal inscriptions called Royal Inscriptions of Mesopotamia, which is pretty much exactly what it sounds like, each volume broken into a certain historical period. The first volume of Assyrian Royal Inscriptions ends with Asher Resh Ishi, which, by which I mean every single known royal inscription including pretty insignificant fragments from the start of Assyrian history up until this guy, fits in a single volume. The volume we're about to enter, by contrast, is about the same size, but only covers some 250 years. Moving forward, the volumes each cover smaller timescales, until we get to the peak of Neo-Assyrian power, and one king, Sennacherib, requires two whole volumes to fit all his royal inscriptions. By this very, very rough approximation, it can be said that there is twice as much source material for this one guy, Sennacherib, than there is for the entire history of Assyria up until this point. And, now that I'm no longer living on a tiny island in the Pacific Ocean, I have access to university libraries and can hopefully bring a whole lot more stuff to fill each episode. Anyway, Asheresh Ishi takes the throne somewhere around 1132 BCE, and as you might expect for some third guy taking the throne after his father and uncle had just killed each other in a power struggle, his throne seems to be not super secure. Judging from his royal inscriptions, helpfully taken from the aforementioned volume, he proved his legitimacy in the eyes of the gods in the most traditional way possible, conquest and construction. Fortunately, the aftershocks of the Bronze Age were still going on, and the entire region was absolutely swarming with barbarian nomads of all sorts. Ahlamu from the west, Lullabian mountain men from the east, Ah, they were both dispatched easy, no problem. In his own words, or at least in the words of the scribe that he commissioned to proclaim his strength to the nation, Asher Resh Ishi was a merciless hero in battle, crusher of the enemies of Asher, a strong bridle controlling the insubmissive, the one who puts the evil insubordinate to flight, murderer of the extensive army of the Ahlamu and scatterer of their forces, the one who, by the command of the god Ninurta, most valiant of the gods, marches about above and below, defeats the lands of the Lulamu, all of the Kutu, and their entire mountainous region, and subdues them at his feet, the one who holds the just scepter, which gathers the scattered subjects, conqueror of all lands, and avenger of Assyria. Now this is, in a sense, pretty standard stuff. He probably fought one or, two or a handful of groups from each of the named ethnicities, and declared himself the great victor, as if the foe was defeated for all time. We'll see this sort of language evolve as the Assyrian Empire grows into the feared Neo-Assyrian Empire, but we already see that this king, using pretty violent language to make clear to the people around him that he's powerful. 
At this scale, he isn't really innovating, but keep an eye out, or I guess an ear out, because the content and flavor of these sorts of declarations is going to be increasingly significant. Anyway, he made all these great boasts upon a temple of Ishtar in the city of Nineveh, a temple which he also rebuilt after an earthquake during Ashurdan's reign. Along with some other monumental constructions, he was definitely working hard to rebuild his legitimacy. At the same time, however, forces in Babylon were working just as hard to undermine that legitimacy. Down in Babylon, Ninurtanad and Shumi had accepted the deposed Assyrian claimant as an exile and started stirring up trouble in the border cities. One city, Arba'il, nowadays the site of the city of the Kurdish capital of Erbil, rose up in a rebellion that, rather unusually, we could say pretty confidently, was instigated by the Babylonians. At the same time as the city rebelled, Ninurtanad and Shumi took his army and invaded, seemingly by another route. Ashereshishi had to decide whether to meet the Babylonians at the city of Zaku or handle the revolt at Arba'il, and it seems he has chosen the revolt, leading to a somewhat famous letter whose text I've sadly been unable to get in full, but is probably the central drama of Ninurta Nadin Shumi's reign. The exact sequence of events is, as usual, unclear, but we can reconstruct it in the following way. During the Arba'il invasion and Ninurta Nadin Shumi's invasion, Ashuresh Ishi was forced to choose between responding to one or the other. It seems that at this stage in history, it's become customary for kings to send letters to each other to select particular battlefields. And as a complete tangent, coordinating battlefields is a super interesting thing that runs through ancient history. You see, when you're marching a whole bunch of guys around the wilderness, that's a lot of empty space to cover. And you've only so many men who can go out and be scouts. You don't have radar or anything like that. So in a very open area, like ancient Mesopotamia, how do you even find the enemy to bring him to battle? Now, sometimes you can pretty well guess where the enemy will be. For example, in the Battle of Kadesh, the region of Canaan right around there has pretty rough terrain, and there's only a few routes that a large army can realistically take to travel north to south. And Kadesh happened to be sighted at one of those key choke points, so it's reasonable that both sides simply expected to fight somewhere around there, even without coordination. But what we also see is that at various times in history, both within the Near East and the wider world, Kingdoms go through phases where it becomes customary for the two opposing sides to send messengers to each other and agree on a set time and place for a pitched battle. It seems that somewhere in the 1120s BCE, Ninurtanad and Shumi sent just such a letter to his Assyrian counterpart suggesting that they have a pitched battle around the town of Zaku. However, when Ashuresh Ishi failed to show up, Ninurtanad and Shumi must have realized that he had gone over to Arba'il. It's not completely clear what the Babylonian king did at this point, but there's a good chance that seeing no chance for a major battle, he, he sat down, he pouted for a while, and then he went home. Maybe his army plundered a bit of pointless towns, but even that's just speculation. When Ninurtanad and Shumi came home, he faced a pretty hostile reception from his court. He had sallied forth into battle and returned without a whole lot to show for it. Insisting that it wasn't his fault, he wrote an angry and somewhat petulant letter to the Assyrian king. In the letter, he complained bitterly that the other king did not meet him in Zaku and reminds him that Babylon still holds that rival claimant. Ninurtanad and Shumi threatens to cross the border and install their claimant on the Assyrian throne, but this is clearly an empty threat, as later in the letter he has occasion to protest impotently that the Assyrian messengers were being rude. All this together tells us that Assyrian power in this moment was unquestionably superior to Babylonian power, and that everyone knows it. 
The sheer impotence of this letter did absolutely nothing to convince the people around Inertanad and Shumi that he has what it takes to be the king of Babylon, and the king's son lit a plot to overthrow, and probably kill, the king shortly after this. Inertanad and Shumi ruled for eight years and was succeeded by his son around 1122 or 1121 BCE. That son, however, would be a man with a famous name. And after a few short years, his Assyrian counterpart will also be another man with a famous name. Now, these aren't actually the famous people with those famous names, but make sure to join us next time as the Assyria Babylon War becomes a contest between two closely matched kings, an inflection point where both powers have a chance to pull ahead and begin to dominate the next period of history. Thank you for listening.